How many times have we talked about changing the culture of political debate in our country? From sound bites to substance. But we haven't had much luck. And our little girl, Tricia, the six-year-old, named it Chuck. You're asking a hypothetical question, and I found out that I never get in trouble if I don't answer one of them. Oh, You're not working on the same platform. I'll tell you something, life. Mr. Clinton. Now, don't try to escape it. Read my lips. With 10questions.com, anyone can post text questions or video questions through YouTube for candidates in the 2010 midterm elections. Each race will have its own page where we aggregate questions posed for candidates in that specific race. Visitors to the site can vote questions up and down. Well, that was the idea. We're going to find out how it worked. It's the idea of 10 questions. These are questions that people there, you could see, could post online and get their candidates to respond via video. How did it all work out? Well, I welcome Daniel Tulis, the project manager of 10 Questions and vice president of business development and marketing for the Personal Democracy Forum. And with us also, one of the people who asked one of the best voted highest questions from Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Martin Michaels, who's a pediatrician. Let's start with you, uh, Daniel. This, well, tell us where the idea came from. It's not brand new this election, but how did the questions change? Well, the idea came from the 0708 debate cycle when CNN and YouTube teamed up to host debates for both the um, Democratic and Republican candidates for president. And what we saw was an incredible outpouring of participation via online video submission from regular Americans across the country asking questions. But at the end, it wasn't really anything different than a regular presidential debate. Journalists still filtered the questions, and candidates still didn't really respond. <laughs> so from that, we thought, we being Personal Democracy Forum, partners across the country, how can we use this technology, the promise of the internet, to flatten the cycle, to make it so that regular Americans, regardless of demographics, graphics or campaign contributions can directly participate in the process. And did the questions change? Do you think people asked things that wouldn't have got asked otherwise? Sure. So a lot of the questions reflect polling trends across America, what Americans are most concerned with, the, the economy, you know, foreign policy, uh, job creation, things like that, things that are very standard. But I think you know, Dr. Michaels in Georgia is an excellent example of getting a question on the candidate's lips that otherwise wasn't being discussed. Dr. Michaels, what was your question? Well, my question was that in our state where I practice in Georgia, our childhood immunization rate has dropped significantly when compared to the other states over the last four or five years. And we also were recently ranked 49th out of 50 states in the country in terms of childhood obesity uh, at the age of 11. And my question for the candidates was, uh, what will you do as governor to improve Georgia's child health statistics. All right, so let's see how the Republican first and then the Democratic candidate for governor there in Georgia fared responding on video. Take a look. Our students in our schools are approaching a 30% obesity rate and that type 2 diabetes is an ever-increasing problem. Part of my education platform deals with a component of wellness. I believe we need to teach our children about healthy eating, healthy lifestyles, well, the first thing I think we need to do is to encourage more fresh food to be served in our school cafeterias. That's the reason we have introduced a plan to put Georgia on your plate. It will be helpful to our farmers and also helpful for the children. All right, Dr. Michaels, seeing that, how did you think uh, Nathan Deal, the Republican, and Roy Barnes, the Democrat there, fared? Well, the question really is, requires a comprehensive approach to resolve these issues. And, you know, for both candidates, um, what they said was very positive, uh, but what they said in and of itself is not enough to really turn these problems around. I believe either candidate is very capable of turning these problems around, but it does take a comprehensive approach, especially with the childhood obesity problem. All right, so there's the actual what was said, and then there's the how it was said. I mean, this is just one example, but what would be your verdict, Daniel? Well, I don't think the technology in this case is a silver bullet. And obviously, these candidates responding aren't going to solve the problems by themselves. But, but does, does the guy have to be wiping his eye when he begins to answer? What doesn't he get about being immortalized on YouTube? Well, I think that this is pretty clear, uh, yet again, evidence that these candidates don't understand this new technology and aren't incorporating it and integrating it into their essential campaign functionality. All right, so well, maybe where I'm fairly picking on the governor's races in, in Georgia, let's go to well 
honed candidates, people with a lot of media training. Um, here's what happened on the California front. Take a look. Net neutrality in principle sounds fantastic, but I grew up in the telecom industry and I know how bureaucratic and frankly antiquated the regulations in the telecom industry have been. I don't think we should take a regulatory structure that was created in the early 20th century and apply it in the 21st century. I strongly believe that we must preserve net neutrality and I've co-sponsored legislation to do just that and I support the FCC doing just that. Consumers should be allowed to use the internet without barriers. We just can't afford to stifle the creativity of internet users and the jobs and the economic growth that come with that creativity. So you have Carly Fiorina there and Barbara Boxer, the candidates for Senate down in California. Um, what did you make of their two responses? I know I have my own reaction. <laughs> well, policy aside for a moment, they both clearly engaged with the question. They obviously took the resources necessary to come up with good answers. And the whole point of 10 questions is not another forum for gotcha politics. The goal is to give them a forum via which they can respond in 10 seconds or 10 minutes and give really thoughtful responses. And I should say, it's great that they asked the question about net neutrality and they, were, had, they had to answer it. Sure, so. and, they and they both gave thoughtful responses. But? Uh, I leave that for the voters to decide. <laughs> what do you think, Dr. Martin? Michaels, I'm sorry. Well, I think, at least from my standpoint, the main issue is, is child health. And, and you know, the economy, uh, for many people, is the number one issue in this election. But I see this problem with child health is probably the biggest economic challenge for the United States to face. Um, our children are the future. They're our future workforce and they're our future uh, lawyers, doctors, engineers, scientists. Because I think this is one of the points is that you're trying to get out the issues here. And I think this is a potentially great avenue for doing it. But it does mean that these candidates are now on the record, on video, which depending on something as simple as, I think, in that California example, a camera angle, I would say Dem Democrat Box's camera angle was a little too low, so she was looking down. Um, it could work against her in a ways you didn't intend. I think that in this election cycle, we've seen candidates more unwilling than ever to get on the record on critical issues. And any time that we can score even a simple victory with getting them on the record, I think it's a win, camera angle aside. Yeah. What about the question of participation, um, Martin Michaels? Did you feel that you participated more than you would have otherwise? And um, how did you feel about it afterwards? Well, I just saw this as really a, a, an opportunity for which I was very grateful. Um, you know, my practice serves about 11,000 children. Most of them are growing up in low-income families, and they don't have a voice. The children don't vote. They don't go to the polls. They don't have a voice. And um, I see every day problems that children experience from not having preventive care and acute and chronic care for medical conditions uh, to the extent that they should have it. And um, without that voice, I, I, when as I was reading and about this 10 questions opportunity, it was clear that this was a way to elevate the issue of child health um, to, to greater visibility uh, in the media. You had some good partners from the media. We worked uh, with traditional media partners across the country. Um, in Georgia, where Dr. Michaels found out about it, it was the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Sacramento Bee in California, and many others, but also working with new media partners as well, the blogosphere, the Huffington Post, among others, trying to reach as many people as we could. You could well see this being adopted going down the road, and it's clearly a great opportunity for people to participate who don't want to go to screaming matches at town halls. Um, is there a danger that people will be participating more alone in their rooms and not eventually going out and meeting with folks? Always. But at the same time, the whole the 10 Questions works as a crowdsourced platform. So the only reason that Dr. Michaels is here today and that his question was answered by the candidates is that enough of his fellow constituents voted up the question because it resonated with them. All right, David Tooley's. You can get more information about the Personal Democracy Forum and Project 10 Votes, uh, 10 Questions, at our website, grittv.org, and votes, too. Information about that as well. Thanks, both of you.